Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part three of Lily Alone by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter five. We had the adventure playground all to ourselves apart from one girl who had taken her baby there. The baby was asleep in his buggy his head lolling. The girl swung listlessly backwards and forwards looking half asleep too. I wondered if mum and I had looked like that once. I suddenly wanted mum so much. I wanted to crouch down and whimper like Pixie when she's tired but I made myself organise the kids instead. I let Baxter stagger up the slide to the makeshift den on top. It was just a few planks of wood, but it was where the big boys hung out. Baxter whooped triumphantly when he found a cigarette butt and, crumpled, and a crumpled can of beer. He squatted at the top, cigarette in one hand, beer in the other, yelling, I'm the boss of this den. Pixie wanted to clamber up after him and perch there too with her teddies and all the paraphernalia from home, but I knew Baxter wouldn't want to share. I know a much better place for our picnic, I said, and I spread out the rug on top of the little roundabout. I hoisted Pixie on top and helped Bliss after her. I felt foolish getting the tebby teddies all settled too, glancing at the girl with the baby, but she didn't seem the slightest bit interested, so we sat and spun slowly round and round and round, propelled by my foot. More! More! Roundy! Roundy! Pixie yelled every time we slowed a to a halt. Then she decided she felt sick and giddy. Headless had the same problem. Pixie grabbed him and made him throw up. How can he be sick when he hasn't got a head? said Bliss. He can't help not having a head, and he's still very sick. Listen, said Pixie. She was making headless make horribly realistic noises. I think I feel sick too, said Bliss, holding her stomach. No, you don't. No one feels sick anymore, I said firmly, because it's time for the picnic. I got the Frosties and Jammy Dodgers and started sharing them out, giving tiny portions to each teddy too. Baxter came tumbling down from his den, demanding his own share and some for his forklift truck. He was still clinging to his soggy cigarettes and can of beer. Throw them away, they're disgusting, I said. You don't know who's had their mouths all around them. Yes, I do. It was one of the big boys, Jacko or Lenny or Big Boots. I'm in their gang now, said Baxter. You wish, I said. I am. I'm the boss of this whole den, said Baxter. I'm your boss, Lily Green, and you have to do exactly what I say. He kicked at me and hurt my leg. I decided to teach him a lesson. Okay, then, I said submissively. What? You're the boss, Baxter. You can tell us all what to do and when to eat and all that stuff. You're in charge now. Yeah, I'm the boss, Baxter said, kicking his heels. Are you listening, Bliss and Pixie, I said. We all have to do what Baxter says now. He's looking after us, us, after us. He's going to tell us what to do. You bet I am, said Baxter, but he sounded uncertain. He bashed his can of beer on the planks of wood. You girls just do what I say, okay? Okay, boss, I said, and Bliss and Pixie said it too. We all looked at Baxter. Yeah, he said again and started picking his nose. He looked at me as if he wanted me to tell him he was being disgusting. I just raised my eyebrows and whistled casually. I made a little crumb meal for all the teddies. Is Headless feeling like eating now? I asked, and Bliss nodded yes. We three girls helped all the teddies have their picnic too, and then we let them slump over, sleeping it off. We slumped too. Baxter was watching us. What should we do now? He said. Well, you've got to say. You're the boss, I said. Yes, well, we'll... Baxter looked all around for inspiration. We can have some more food, he said eventually, licking his finger and dabbing up a few biscuit crumbs. Good idea, boss. So where are we going to get it from? I said. We'll steal it, said Baxter, looking fierce. He looked over at the girl with her sleepy baby in the buggy. I bet they've got biscuits, he said. Okay, go and steal them then, I said. Baxter swallowed. He looked hard at the girl. She was twice his size and was frowning. She looked like she'd slap him one if he even dared speak to her. Maybe I'm not really hungry, said Baxter. This is boring, he said. You be the boss now, Lily. You tell us what we're going to do. Had it all figured out, it had just suddenly occurred to me. I was so excited by the idea, I had little goosebumps all the way up and down my arms. We'll go to the park, I said. What park? Parks are boring, 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 said Baxter. Not this park. The great park we can see from the flats. The one with all the hills and trees. Baxter stared at me. So did Bliss. They'd come up to the top floor balcony with me. They'd seen the hills and trees for themselves, but it was like something they'd seen on television. Can we really get to that park, said Bliss. Of course we can, I said. Though I'd never really thought about it before. Mum had never taken us. But Mum didn't wear the right shoes for parks. She either wore her high heels or flip-flop sandals in summer that let in all the grit and stones and made her swear. Do you know the way, Lily? said Bliss. Of course I do, I said. Well, I thought I did. Our flat seemed almost next door to the park when you looked from the top balcony. But down on the ground I wasn't really sure how to find it. I knew the way to the bus stop to get into town. I knew how to get to the chippy and the sweet shop. I knew how to get to school, so I reckoned if I turned the other way, we'd find, our, uh, find ourselves in the park in no time. 
Perhaps it would have been easier on my own. It was hard work herding Baxter and Bliss along, especially with all the teddies and teapots and stuff, and I didn't have Pixie's buggy, so I had to carry her half the way. Where is the park then? said Baxter, peering all around. This is all just houses. Yes, it's right down this road, I'm sure of it, I said. But we trailed up roads, down roads, all over and still couldn't find it. Are we lost? said Bliss anxiously. Of course we're not lost, I said, but my heart started thumping hard in my chest. We hadn't found the park, and now I wasn't certain how to find our way back to the flats. Should we ask someone? Bliss suggested. No, they'll wonder why we're not in school, I said. They didn't look the right sort of people to ask anyway. They weren't ordinary people out here. They were all very posh people. This old lady cutting flowers in her garden in her funny padded waistcoat, and this old man getting into his shining car, and this big woman striding along in her check shirt and iron jeans taking her lollipop Labrador for a walk. Ah, we'll follow that lady, I said. She marched down the road, turned left, and the dog started straining forward eagerly. I saw iron gates right up at the end of the, per of, end of the road. There's the park, I said. There was an ice cream van parked by the gates, and all three of the kids clamoured for a whippy. But I didn't have any money. Pixie started howling, kicking me hard as I held her. I want an ice cream, she wailed, her mouth square with grief. Stop that kicking, it hurts. Look, Pixie, we're going in the park now. Isn't it lovely? No, it's horrid. I don't like the park. I like ice cream, Pixie yelled, still kicking. But after a minute or so, she calmed down and started staring around, astonished. Shh, now I said, see, it is lovely here. We seemed to have stepped straight from the town to the countryside. I'd never seen so much green before. All different shades of green, from the leaves, the ferns, the grass, even the birds squawking above our heads were green. Flocks of parakeets. It wasn't flat and boring like other parks. There was a big hill right in front of us, with a pebbly path leading upwards. Come on, race you to the top, said Baxter. He started scrambling upwards. Of course he got there long before us, because all he had to carry was his forklift truck. I had Pixie, who was still refusing to walk, and Bliss lugged the blanket full of teddies. The teapot fell out of the blanket halfway up and broke its spout and handle. Oh, look, said Bliss, panicking. Mum will be so cross. No, she won't. She hardly ever uses it, I said quickly. Can we mend it? It looks too broken, I said, but never mind. I kicked the teapot hard into the bushes. There, it's gone now. It's not a teapot anymore. It's a little home for a hedgehog or a squirrel. OK, don't look so worried, Bliss. Mum won't ever know. I dumped Pixie. Gave Bliss a quick hug, and then held my sister's hands and pulled them up to the top of the hill, where Baxter was waiting for us, scarlet and triumphant. I won, I won! You're all slow coaches. I got here ages ago, and look, there are animals. We were standing on a grassy plain, and only a little way away, a large herd of red deer were staring at us, blinking their big brown eyes. There were several deer who stood tensely, their noses in the air, but most of them went on munching grass, flicking their strange little tails. They were mostly females, with their young, beautiful little fawns that danced about. But there was one big stag with great antlers growing out of his head like massive branches. Will he hurt us? Bliss whispered, clutching me. I don't think so, I said. Lovely doggies, said Pixie, and she started running towards them fearlessly. No, Pixie, stop, I said, catching her by the back of her t-shirt. Don't. You're startling them. Don't make them run away. I want them to run, said Baxter, and I'll run after them, and I'll get a long stick and spear them and kill them all dead. Stop it, you monster. You can't want to kill them. They're beautiful, I said. Yes, I do. You hunt deer. I know you do. And I'm a hunter, said Baxter, swaggering about, miming his spear. But when the stag raised his huge head and took one step towards us, Baxter clutched my hand tightly and pressed up against me. He's coming to get us, Bliss squealed. No, he's not. He's just looking at us to see we're OK. And we are, I said. Let's sit down and stay quiet and watch them. We sat down and counted them. Well, three of us did. Pixie had no idea about numbers and went one, two, three, twenty, a hundred. The deer kept moving around, so we all got muddled. There were about thirty altogether. Bliss and I tried to sort them into families. I rather liked the idea of having lots of mothers and children all living together with just one father. We started choosing names for them. I chose Brown Eyes and Bramble and Moonbeam and Fleetfoot and Apple and Tree Wind and Jumper and Snufflenose and Wagtail. Baxter called the stag King, and the others Soldier and Sailor and Bad Boy, and Fighter and Kung Fu and Big Head and Nasher and Fang, all boys' names, though I kept telling him they were girls. Bliss chose real girls' names, Judy and Shelley and Katie and Claire, Ella and Sarah and Hannah and Lizzie and Mandy. We let Pixie choose names for the smallest, Fluffy and Muffy and Duffy. We couldn't really keep track of which was which, apart from the stag and the small ones, but it was a good game and we repeated our own names over and over so that we would remember them. Then a man walked past with a dog. It was on a lead, but it barked at the deer and they all ran off. 
king and all his ladies and children. We stood up and ran after them, but they were much faster than we were. We followed them through the trees and then onto another grassy plain, where there were lots of little grey rabbits popping in and out of their burrows. Oh, a rabbit, please, Lily. Can we have a rabbit? Bliss begged. I'll catch you one, said Baxter, but thank goodness he was nowhere near quick enough. We carried on walking through more trees. Some of them were very old and gnarled with strange knots and warty bits, so they looked like faces. They're just like the trees in my fairy tale book, said Bliss. Can we play we're princesses, Lily? Of course we can, Princess Bliss, I said. We're three enchanted princesses, dancing through the forest, and Baxter's, Baxter's a handsome prince. No, I'm not. I'm a big bad ogre, and I'm going to stamp and stomp after all you silly princesses, and bash you with my stick, and bake you in a pot, and eat you for my supper, said Baxter. No, no, you can be an ogre, but you bang your head on the topmost branches of the tree because you're so tall and you fall down bleeding all over the place, wailing and moaning, and we princesses take pity on you. We dip our petticoats in a handy stream and wash the blood away and put special herbs on your gaping wound and bandage you up with more petticoats. And you're so grateful you become our friend and protect us when we all go on our journey, I said, and we acted it out, even Pixie. Several times people walking their dogs came and smiled, but one woman stopped and stood watching us. I heard my voice go all high and silly, worried that she'd think me such a baby for playing pretend fairy stories. That sounds a fun game, she said, but why aren't you in school? I felt my cheeks flushing, and I saw the others go red too. Baxter clenched his fists, and I knew he was going to blurt out something cheeky, which would be a big mistake. We've had chicken pox, I said quickly. We're better now, but still not well enough to go to school. Oh goodness, chicken pox, she said. She was peering at us. I can't see any scabs. I said, we're almost better now. But you are you are you playing all alone? No, no, our mum's here with us, I said. The woman looked around. Where is she? I wished Baxter was a real ogre and could simply kill her with his stick. She's over there, I said, waving vaguely. Then inspiration struck. She told us not to talk to strangers, so we've got to go now. Come on, you three. Well, that's very sensible, said the woman. Though, of course, I don't mean you any harm. Yes, but mum says you can't trust anyone nowadays, I said. Come on, you lot, let's run back to mum. I grabbed Pixie and started running. Thank goodness Baxter and Bliss ran along beside us. I was scared the woman would run after us, but she was quite old, and thank goodness she didn't even try. Keep running, I panted, wanting to be sure, so we ran and ran down Sandy Pass, through the trees until the woman was no longer in sight. I, I can't, Bliss puffed. Okay, we can have a little rest now, I said, and we all leaned against a big oak tree gaping and gasping. Knows the old bat, said Baxter at last. Yes, wasn't she? But you told her, Lily. Yes, I did, didn't I? Where's mum? said Pixie, peering all around. Oh, darling, mum's not really here. I was just pretending to that lady. I want mum, said Pixie. I want mum too, Bliss whispered. Baxter didn't say anything, but he started kicking the tree, his face screwed up. I know, I said. I want mum too, but she'll be back soon. She's having a lovely holiday, and so are we, aren't we? Aren't we? They all nodded solemnly at me because I was asking so fiercely. Let's walk on a bit then. I'm sure that nosy old lady's gone now, I said. We set off again. Pixie walking, thank goodness. She kept stopping to examine stones or pick a dandelion, but at least I didn't have to lug her about. Bliss was the one who was floundering, staggering along with Headless and all his friends. Come here, let me carry that lot for you, I said. Shall I carry you too, Bliss? I was joking, but she looked hopeful. Oh dear, I can't really, you're too big now, I said. Come on, let's just walk together. Where are we walking to? Bliss asked. Well, we're princesses in the enchanted forest, and we're trying to find... I looked around wildly. There was an iron railing on the left, enclosing thick woods and shrubs. I saw a flash of pink far away. We're trying to find the magic garden, I said. Then further up, I saw an ornate black gate. There we are. There's the gate. We found it. Come on, let's see if we can get inside. We went through the gate. It was as if we really were in a magic garden. It seemed much quieter than the rest of the park, but the birds were singing louder. A flock of green parakeets circled over our heads, screeching at us. We held hands and walked down one of the stony paths. Suddenly, we were surrounded by colour. Deep red, scarlet, orange, apricot, pink and purple. Flowers in long he hedges, flowers in bushes, flowers in trees. They were all different flowers, but I didn't know their names. They're magic roses, I said. Aren't they beautiful? And they're blooming just for us. We walked slowly down the path, admiring the flowers, almost on tiptoe. Even Baxter seemed awed, pressing his nose against the blossoms. Watch out, a bee doesn't go up your nostril, I said. Can we pick the flowers, Lily? asked Pixie. No, absolutely not. Then they won't be magic anymore, I said. She ran ahead. A stream trickled beneath the flower hedges with wooden footbridges. Pixie skipped onto one and then put her foot out tentatively. 
Paddle, she said. No, it's a magic stream. If you paddle in it, you could turn into a duck. Look, see those poor silly children. They've all been turned into ducks. I pointed to several mallards quack quacking further up the stream. Pixie put her foot back on the bridge, sharpish. We found a real duck pond further into the garden, and then another right at the end, with a huge weeping willow. We hid under its long trailing branches and pretended it was our cave. There were more people at this end of the garden, old couples walking very slowly around the pond and feeding the ducks. I knew they could still see us through the green fart fronds, but they didn't try to talk to us. Isn't it lovely to see the kiddies playing here? One old man remarked to his wife, and she agreed happily. A group of younger women with buggies came along and spread themselves out on a sunny patch of grass, unpacking a picnic. We peeped out at them enviously as they shared sandwiches and gave their babies carrot sticks and little tubs of yoghurt. I want some, said Pixie. Where's our picnic? We'd long since eaten the biscuits and the frosties. I'm hungry too, said Bliss. I'm starving, said Baxter. They looked at me as if they expected me to magic a picnic out of thin air. We're going to have magic food, I said. Look, we've got a set of solid gold plates and they're full to the brim of beautiful fruits and we've got goblets of magic lemonade. You're talking rubbish, Baxter interrupted. I don't really want silly magic stuff. I want something real. Don't be so rude and ungrateful. I'm trying my best, I said. Ask them ladies for some of their food. Go on, said Baxter. Don't be silly. I can't possibly, I said. Stop thinking of your stomach and play the game. I don't want to play your stupid game, said Baxter, and he hit me with his fork forklift truck. But we got lucky. One of the toddlers was in a bad mood too. He started whinging and fussing and tried to snatch another baby's banana. His mother tutted and took the banana away. So he threw himself down on the grass and kicked and screamed. That baby's hurting my head, said Bliss, her hands over her ears. He's so naughty, said Pixie smugly. One of the little babies started wailing too. The mothers shook their heads and sighed and started gathering up their stuff and slotting the babies back in their buggies. The toddler was still screaming, arching his back and refusing to cooperate. You did that when you were little, I told Baxter. It used to drive mum demented. Yeah, I bet I really yelled, said Baxter proudly. One of the mothers was gathering up the picnic. She tossed all the sandwiches, the half-eaten yogurts, the banana skins and carrot sticks, the crumbling rusks and half-sucked oranges into one big carrier bag, and then she crammed it into the rubbish bin. We all stared. The moment they were moving, a wagon train of buggies, babies and bags, Baxter was off, darting to the bin and yanking out the discarded picnic. He brought it back under our willow tree and I started reassembling it on the ground. But it's got all muddled up. There's yoghurt on this sandwich and biscuit crumbs everywhere, said Bliss. We can't eat it like that. Of course we can, I said. Don't you think all your food gets muddled up in your tummy? Yes, but I don't have to see it like that, said Bliss. I found her a totally pristine sandwich and an untouched yoghurt and she was happy. Baxter, Pixie, Pixie and I were less picky and ate the rest between us. This is better than all that magic mucking about, said Baxter, with his mouth full. When we'd finished every last scrap we lay down, Pixie's head on my tummy, the twins either side, the girls fell asleep. Baxter mumbled quietly, driving his truck up and down my legs. I dozed a little myself, happy in the magic garden. Pixie woke me up when she wanted to do a wee. I let her go behind a bush. Baxter went too, but Bliss was too bashful to do likewise. She pretended she didn't need to go, but she got very pink and fidgety. Luckily, when we went wandering back to the front of the garden, we found a little toilet cabin, so she and I could go in comfortable privacy. We played a game of hide-and-seek amongst all the rosy bushes, Pixie and I playing against Baxter and Bliss, and then we ran races up and down the stream, charging across the little wooden bridges. Most of the people in the garden smiled, but one old man with binoculars made shushing noises at us. You're frightening all the birds away, he said. The birds didn't seem the slightest bit frightened, screeching above our heads. I love, love, love this garden, I said. And the others agreed. Can we go here again tomorrow, said Bliss. Yes, of course we can. And the next day, and the next. You bet. And we'll carry on coming here when Mum comes home. Will Mum love it too, said Bliss. Well, never mind. You can be our Mum in the park, she said. It was a mistake talking about Mum, though. We all started missing her a lot. Pixie started grizzling, Baxter started showing off and swearing, and Bliss started biting her nails. Come on, we're all tired. Let's go home now, I said. It's okay, I promise we'll come back tomorrow. We found our way to the garden gate easily, easily enough, but we got lost going through the proper park. We were wandering for ages through the trees, up and down hills, never finding the right path. I tried to turn it into a game, but I was tired too, and soon I started snapping at all three of them. I couldn't carry Pixie anymore and dragged her along. I prodded Bliss and swatted Baxter. We had to ask a middle-aged couple in matching green and purple sweatshirts how to get out. They pointed us in the right way, but it looked at us uneasily. Aren't you a bit young to be playing in the park by yourselves? The woman asked. We're not. We wandered off and lost our mum, I said. 
What? For goodness sake, she'll be frantic. No, no, I phoned her on my mobile, I said, patting my empty jeans pocket. She just said to come straight to the park gates and she'll meet us there. Well, we'd better come with you to make sure you get there, said the woman. No, please don't. Mum will get even crosser then. It's all my fault. I was meant to be looking after them, I said, and I screwed my face up as if I was trying not to cry. I thought she'd feel sorry for me and let me go, but she looked more worried than ever. No, we absolutely insist. You might get lost again. It's a good 15 minute walk, maybe longer. Come along. It's this way, she said, while we stared at her horrified. Pixie started crying for real, and the woman looked concerned. Oh dear, is she hungry? she asked. Yes, yes, Pixie wailed, as if she hadn't eaten for days. Poor little pet. Uh, what do you want, darling? Ice cream, said Pixie. Oh, I saw what she was up to. She'd heard the word gate and remembered the whippy van. We haven't got any ice cream, dear, but we've maybe got a nice peppermint, said the woman. Arnie, you've got the polos in your pocket, haven't you? Arnie didn't look as if he, were, he wanted to share his polo mints, but he got them out and offered the po packet nervously in the direction of Pixie, as if she was a snappy dog and might bite. She grabbed at the packet and then turned up her nose at the smell. It's toothpaste, she said, looking accusingly at Arnie, as if he played a dirty trick on her. I like polos, said Baxter. Arnie handed them round to all of us. Say thank you, I hissed. But Baxter, Baxter wouldn't, and Bliss was too shy, and Pixie too intent on whining for ice cream. I could have shaken all of them. I didn't know what to do. Arnie's wife was trying to make conversation all the way. What were our names? Where exactly did we live? Which school did we go to? I started telling her a whole load of lies to stop her tracking us down. I'm Rose, and this is my brother Mikey, and my sister Bluebell, and my littlest sister Bunny, I said, picking names I knew the kids would like, so they'd go along with the charade. I said we lived on a different estate, the other end of town, and, uh, and I had us all going to different school too. Then she twittered on and on about it, asking us what we liked best at school. I like art, I said truthfully. I do too, said Bluebell, in a tiny whispery voice. Is art painting? We do finger painting at nursery, and I, I love getting in a mess, said Bunny. I like fighting, said Mikey, punching the air. Turned out Arnie and his wife Elizabeth had been school teachers once upon a time, but they'd both retired now. Though we're so busy, I don't know how we ever had time to work, said Elizabeth. Yes, they were busy, 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 poking their sharp teacher's noses into our affairs. I didn't have a clue how we were going to get rid of them. I kept wondering if I should simply yell, run, and grab Bunny and yank Mikey and Bluebell into action. But I still wasn't very sure how far the gate was. Although old Arnie walked in a tottery kind of way, his wife bounced along in her trainers. Perhaps she'd been a PE teacher. I could imagine a whistle bouncing on her big chest. I didn't want her blowing the whistle on us. I tried to think of some way we could successfully escape, nibbling at the skin on my lip as we walked. You're looking really worried, Rose, said Elizabeth. Do you think your mother will get very cross? I didn't know what to say for the best. Yes, she'll get really mad and start whacking us ever so hard, said Mikey, thinking he was helping me out. Elizabeth looked shocked. Your mother hits you, she asked. No, of course she doesn't, I said quickly. Yes, she does. She goes whack, 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 said Mikey, gesturing. But it's okay because I go kapow, 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 and I always beat her and get to be the winner because I'm the best at fighting. I think you're the best at storytelling, said Elizabeth, relaxing. We got to the top of the hill and then started on the downward slope, me holding Bunny by her wrist to stop her tumbling. I saw the car park and the gate. Bunny started clamouring, ice cream, until I thought my head would burst. Nearly there, said Elizabeth. Can you see any sign of your mum? But then, oh glory, some couple got out of their car with a daft spaniel leaping up and down. They started calling and waving. Elizabeth, Arnie, oh my goodness, fancy seeing you here. Good Lord, are these your grandchildren? There's mum, I shouted, while they were distracted. Thank you very much, goodbye. And then we ran for it. I started waving wildly at a woman by the gate, a fat, silly-looking woman, nothing like our mum, and she waved back, startled, obviously feeling she knew us. Bliss and Baxter ran beside me, and I managed to clutch Pixie. We could hear Elizabeth and Arnie calling us, uh, calling as the dog barked, but we just ran faster. When we got to the gate, I threw my arms around this complete stranger, practically knocking her over. Hello, what's all this about? She said, laughing nervously. Oh, I thought, I thought you were someone I know, I said. I'm sorry, I've got to go now. Come on, kids. We ran again, dodging up the first side street to where, so we'd get, no, get to, so we'd not be visible from the gate. When we were around a corner, I let us slow down. We leaned against a garden wall, all of us utterly out of breath. Phew, said Pixie. It was such a strangely old-fashioned thing for her to say that we all burst out laughing. Phew, 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 Pixie repeated delightedly. We trudged on, trudged on up the road, all of us fewing like anything. My feet hurt, right on their underneath, said Baxter, limping a little. My everything hurts, Bliss mumbled. Never mind, we'll be home soon. 
and we'll all have a nice hot bath and a special treat for supper. I promised. You'll get your ice cream, Pixie. I know Mum puts them in the freezer. I want whippy, she moaned. Yes, well, I'll squish it around and make it whippy, and we'll put cream on the top. Can I have cream too? asked Bliss. We'll all have cream. Am I still Bluebell? If you want to be. No, I think I want to be me now. Then that's who you are. Who we all are. Lily and Baxter and Bliss and Pixie. And we're nearly home. We got back to our estate safely without going all round the moon. I started worrying now about the unlocked door. Maybe we'd get back and find the whole flat ransacked. Mess everywhere. I'd seen what some of the boys could do if they wanted to teach you a lesson. My chest felt tight and I could scarcely breathe as we crept along the balcony trying to avoid alerting old calf. But when I peeped around the door, everything was just as usual. Certainly not neat and tidy, but it was only our own mess. There was a little beeping noise in the hallway. It was a message flashing on the telephone. Chapter 6 I pressed the button on the phone and Mum's voice spoke into the hall. Mum! 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 We all called her name. Baxter jumped up and down. Bliss doubled over, clasping her tummy. Pixie wriggled, clutching herself. We were all making so much noise that we couldn't properly hear what she was saying. Shh, sh you lot, I said. Oh, if only we'd been home. Mum, I, I want to talk to Mum, said Pixie, trying to clutch the phone. No, darling, it's just a message from Mum. Listen, maybe she's telling us what she, well, when she's coming home. Come on, shut up, all of you. It's important, I said. Mum said goodbye. Baxter and Bliss whispered goodbye back and Pixie started crying. I pressed the button again as soon as the tape had rewound. Hi, you kids. Where are you then? I figured you'd be back from school by now. I bet Mikey's taking you down McDonald's. Anyway, listen, my blooming mobile doesn't work here. Don't ask me why, but I've sneaked off and I'm using a payphone, though it's eating all my change. I'm just checking up and making sure you're okay. You're looking after them all right, Mikey, right? Lily, you give Pixie a cuddle from me, eh? And see she gets to bed on time. You know how ratty she is if she doesn't get enough sleep. Baxter, you be a good boy. Now for your dad. And Bliss, you speak up for yourself. Lily, you should see it here. You'd love it. My God, the colour of the sky. It's bright, bright blue. Just the way you crayoned it when you were little. I'll take you here one day. When I'm in the money. I'll take you all. That's a promise. Well, gotta go now. Nearly out of money. I'm having a great time. Gordon's a sweetheart. You should see the way everyone looks up to him. How do you like him for a new daddy, eh? Ha <laughs> Only joking. I'll be back soon. Maybe the weekend. Whenever. But I know you're in good hands with Mikey, eh? Bye then, darlings. Bye-bye. Baxter and Bliss said goodbye all over again. Pixie shivered, her knees together. Ah, uh, look, she's wetting the carpet, said Baxter, pointing. Oh, Pixie, I said, picking her up and whipping her to the toilet. I want Mum, she wept. Yes, darling, we all want Mum, but she's coming home soon, I said, yanking her soggy knickers down and sitting her on the toilet. But she still hadn't said exactly when she was coming home. Maybe the weekend, whatever. Did that mean she hadn't even booked her flight yet? I stood hanging on to the cold edge of the wash basin, loving mum and hating mum all at the same time. I thought of her lying on a beach towel with new daddy Gordon underneath this bright blue sky, and I wanted to kick sand in her face. How could she leave us like this? But then she thought we were with Mikey, in good hands. I thought of Mikey's huge fists with their self-inked tattoos and their big sovereign rings, and I shuddered. At least we didn't have to put up with him all week. I want mum, Pixie wailed on the toilet. Look, I'll be your mum just for this week, I said. Your Lily, said Pixie. Yeah, I know, but I'll be your Lily mum, okay? Lily mum, Pixie repeated. Luckily, she quite liked the sound of it. Lily mum, Lily mum, Lily mum. She laughed as I gave her a quick wash and found her dry knickers. That's right, Lily mum's going to get you a lovely tea now, I said. Do you want to come and help me do the cooking, eh, Pixie? Pixie clapped her hands. We went to find the others. Baxter was curled up on the sofa, his head on a cushion, while Bliss softly patted his back. She was crying too. Hey, hey, no tears now. Mum's coming back soon. And meanwhile, I'm Lily Mum, and I'm going to cook you all tea. If you're Lily Mum, I'm Bluebell again, Bliss asked, sniffing. You can be whoever you like, darling. Come on into the kitchen. You can help make the tea too. What are we having, said Baxter, his voice muffled by the cushion. Sausages, and then ice cream. I cooked the sausages under the grill because I didn't want to risk the frying pan, not with them all jumping about the kitchen with me. I got Baxter to prick them first with a fork. He pretended each one was a little pig and stuck it to death. I let Pixie sprinkle a packet of oven chips into a tray and then pop them into the oven. I opened a can of beans and let Bliss stir them in the pan, as I knew she'd be the most careful. I took a block of ice cream out of the freezer and lined up the can of cream and some raspberry jam all ready and poured us each a glass of lemon drink. 
The kids got a bit fidgety waiting for the chips to crisp up and I didn't want them bumping into me while I turned the hot sausages so I sent them off to watch telly for 10 minutes. I didn't call them back till I dished up. I felt so happy when they clapped their hands at their full plates. We ate heartily. I didn't nag about table manners and let them eat their sausages and chips with their fingers though I did make them use forks for the baked beans. Then I mashed the ice cream until it was all sort of whippy and smothered each scoop with cream and jam, creating my very own ice cream sundaes. Happy now, Pixie? I asked. She grinned at me. I love you, Lily Mum, she said, smacking her lips together. It was the most peaceful evening. We just lolled around the living room watching television. Pixie nodded off where she was, so I picked her up and carried her to bed. Bliss was nearly asleep too, snuggling up to headless and sucking her thumb. Even Baxter was still for once, flopped full length on the carpet like a tiger skin rug. I gave them another half hour and then scooped them up too. When they were tucked up on the mattress, I felt so tired I wanted to crawl in with them. But I was Lily Mum now. I cleared up the kitchen, washed up the glasses and plates and put the pans in to soak. Then I got the broom and swept under the table and wiped it down with a damp cloth. I hummed softly and smiled sweetly, even if there was no one to see me. I wanted to look like all those pretty cosy mums you see in the telly adverts. I wasn't imitating my mum. She always left the dirty dishes till morning and rarely swept up. Life's too short to faff around with a mop all the time, she'd say. Why should I waste it on housework? I found I quite liked getting the kitchen clean and tidy, even though I was so tired. I daydreamed about my own flat in the future. I'd clean it every single day, even though there'd be no children to make it messy. I suppose I'd let Bliss and Baxter and Pixie come on, vi on a visit, but most of the time I'd be there alone. I'd play beautiful music and loll on my gorgeous rugs and stare out of my picture of my picture windows. My flat would be very high up, the penthouse suite, so maybe I'd be able to see all the hills and trees of our special park. I wouldn't ever ever go off on holiday. I went into Mum's bedroom and breathed in her special scent. I fiddled with some of her leftover makeup, smearing grey on my eyelids and purpley on my lips. Then I opened her wardrobe and selected one of her dresses just to see whether I could look properly grown up. Stuffed my feet into some high heels and wiggled across the carpet to the mirror. But I looked ludicrous, a small shiny clown in a stupid dress. I tore off all the clothes, washed my face and then got into Mum's bed. Come back, I said into her pillow. I'm not big enough. I don't want to be the mum. Come back right now. I felt it so fiercely I was almost certain that mum in Spain would feel it too. She'd clutch her heart and go, my kids. I'm sorry, Gordon. I have to get home to my kids. She'd get a taxi to the airport right that minute. I thought about her return ticket. What if Gordon wouldn't pay for it? She had her dodgy credit card, but what if that wouldn't work either? I couldn't stop thinking about it. I started thumping my forehead to try to stop all the worries. I shut my eyes and tried to invent an alternative world. I wasn't Lily Green, older sister of Baxter and Bliss and Pixie. I was Rose, and Mikey and Bluebell and Bunny didn't exist. I had long fair hair down to my waist and big blue eyes, and I wore wonderful designer clothes every single day. I didn't have a mother or a father. No, I had a lovely, kind, fabulously rich uncle, just like Mr Abbott at school, and he indulged me terribly. He took me out to a West End show every night, and afterwards we had tremendously grand suppers at posh restaurants with waiters in fancy outfits, and we both drank champagne. At weekends, my uncle took me to art galleries, and we walked around all the paintings hand in hand. At the end of each visit, my uncle told me to choose my favourite painting, and then he had it wrapped and sent to me. When I woke in the middle of the night, the mum thoughts were whirling around in my head again, and I couldn't pretend vividly enough to blot them out. I didn't realise I was crying until I heard someone creep into Mum's bedroom and wriggle into bed with me. Lily, said Bliss, her cold little fingers patting me. Lily, don't cry. It'll be all right. No, it won't, I sobbed. Yes, it will. You'll look after us. You're great at looking after us. Better than Mum, said Bliss. I'm sick of being the Mum. Bliss was quiet for a moment and then she put her arms around my neck. It's okay then. I'll be Mum tomorrow, she said. Oh, Bliss, I said, crying more. I'm the mum and you're my little girl and I'm going to give you a great big cuddle and then you're going to be fast asleep, said Bliss. Bliss couldn't look after anyone, not even herself. But when she told me and held me, she did feel a bit like a real mum. I fell asleep again and we didn't wake up until morning. There was no sound coming from Baxter and Pixie, so we left them sleeping. Bliss and I stayed curled up, still playing that she was the mum and I was the little girl. I'm hungry, mum, I said in an ickle baby voice. Don't worry, baby, I'll feed you, said Bliss. I was expecting pretend food, but she slipped out of bed and disappeared into the kitchen. She came back with a packet of crisps. Here you are, darling, baby rusks, she said, shaking the packet at me. 
she got back into bed and started feeding me crisps, popping several into her own mouth too. Oh dear, we're getting a lot of crumbs in the bed, I said. Mum will murder us when she comes home. No, we'll murder her for leaving us all alone, said Bliss. Hey Bliss, that's not like you. I'm not me anymore. We're all getting different. What, you mean Baxter's very quiet and gentle and sensible, I said. We both giggled and dabbed our fingers round the packet for the last little crumbs of crisp. We don't need any breakfast now, I said, but when the others woke up and we were all sitting at the kitchen table, Bliss and I ate a mound of, to mound of toast. I was a bit worried about the bread running out, but I couldn't help it. I didn't feel exactly hungry, but there was an empty sick feeling inside me and food helped fill it up. I was just buttering a third piece of toast when there was a knock on the front door. We all stared at each other. Mum, said Pixie. No, it won't be Mum, silly. Mum's got a key. Dad, said Baxter. Your dad's in Scotland. It won't be him. Anyway, he's got his own key too. Listen, we won't answer it, just in case, I whispered. Keep quiet now. We sat still, not even munching. There was another knock, and then the letterbox rattled. Lily, Lily Green, are you there? It's me, Sarah, she called. She lived on the next floor up from us and was in Mr. Abbott's class too. What does she want? I decided I'd better go and see if she was going to carry on like that. I didn't want old Calf hearing her and shuffling down the balcony to investigate. I went to the door and opened it a crack, peering round. Yes, it was Sarah in her green check school dress. Aren't you up yet? She said, squinting at my pyjamas. No, I've got a bug. We've all got it. Don't come too near, Sarah. OK, don't breathe your germs on me. Anyway, Mr Abbott wants to know if you're coming on the gallery trip tomorrow. He says to tell you he saved a place on the coach. Oh, but I haven't paid. He says you're not to worry about that. It sounds as if he's going to pay for you. Really? Oh, he's so lovely. Sarah wrinkled her nose. Mr Abbott, he's not lovely. He's weird. No, he's not. Well, you would say that because you're a bit weird too, she said. Will you tell him thank you? Yes, OK. And I'll say you're coming? I hesitated. I badly wanted to go on the school trip with Mr Abbott. I imagined this gallery lined with famous paintings and Mr Abbott and me walking around it together. Mr Abbott would tell me about each painting and then ask me solemnly if I liked it, acting like he really wanted to know. I'll come if... if I'm better, I said. Pixie scrabbled at my back, squeezing through my legs. Mum, she said. What, said Sarah. I'm not your mum, dopey. Pixie's not very well either, I said, picking her up. Come on, darling, we'd better put you back in bed. Bye, Sarah. I shut the door on her and Pixie struggled with me. Not bed, not bed, don't want to go back to bed. No, I was just pretending. It's okay, Pixie. I let her run back to the kitchen. I stayed in the hall, thinking about lovely Mr Abbott. Could I risk going to school on Wednesday? Could we all go? But they'd wonder where Mum was. They'd certainly ask at the nursery. And Pixie would talk. Was there any way she could stay at home? Bliss could perhaps look after her? No, Bliss was far too little. She could maybe manage Pixie, but she'd never be able to control Baxter. He walked all over her. I couldn't leave them. I couldn't go to the gallery. I stamped back to the kitchen, wishing I was an only child. Everything the kids said got on my nerves. I'd planned to take them back to the magic garden in the park, but it was a grey, gloomy day, already drizzling, and by the time we'd all got dressed, it was really pouring with rain. Well, we'll just have to stay in instead, I said, sighing. I'm going out, said Baxter. I don't mind a bit of rain. I'm going to that park. No, you're not. No one goes out when it rains like this. People will notice and think it's weird. No one will see me if no one goes out, said Baxter triumphantly. I'm going there, so there, you can't stop me. Stop being such a pain, Baxter. Oh, no, you're the pain, bossing us about. I'm nearly as big as you and I'm the boy anyway. I should be doing the bossing, so you can just shut your big mouth, right? I'm going out. Oh, go out then, see if I care, I snapped. Right, well, I'm going, said Baxter. Okay. Go, I said. Yes, watch me, said Baxter, and he marched out. He slammed the front door behind him as hard as he could. Oh, great. Baxter, let old Calf know too, I muttered. Baxter's naughty, said Pixie. Yes, he is, I said. He won't really go to the park, will he, said Bliss. He might get lost. Good, I said. Bliss started nibbling at her fingers. Don't look so anxious. You're such a wuss, Bliss. Of course he won't be going all the way to the park. He might go as far as the den, but I doubt it. He's probably just lurking on the balcony. He wants us to worry, but I'm not worried one little bit. Now, are you girls going to help me wash up? I fetched a chair for Pixie and she stood at the sink with Bliss, washing up the dishes. They poured so much washing up liquid into the bowl that soap suds came up to their armpits. When they'd done all the dishes, I fetched my old Barbie dolls and they gave them a deluxe spa treatment. I kept listening out for Baxter. 
Every now and then I thought I heard him and went running to the door, but there was never anyone there. I hung over the balcony, peering along to the playground, but I couldn't see him there. It was still bucketing down, so if he had any, any sense whatsoever, he'd be huddled up in the den out of sight. I waited until the Barbies had had their plunge baths and massage and their hair newly styled, and I'd organised a glamour photo shoot in the studio under the kitchen table. Bliss and Pixie laughed uproariously as I made the Barbies show off their pointy chests and strut about provocatively, but Bliss's laughter sounded high-pitched and hysterical, and I knew she was near tears. Baxter was generally pretty mean to his sister, bossing her around and giving her a thump whenever he felt like it, but she acted like she'd lost an arm and a leg whenever they were apart. Maybe it was a twin thing, and she simply couldn't help it. Pixie didn't seem to be missing Baxter at all. Lily, Bliss whispered as we dressed the Barbies. Lily, do you think Baxter's all right? No, Baxter's all wrong, we all know that, I joked. Okay, okay, I'll go and fetch him back. He'll be hiding in the den. You shouldn't worry so, Bliss. I went to get my coat and tied Mum's leopard print scarf over my head. Can we come too? No, you stay here, Bliss, with Pixie. There's no point all of us getting soaked. Now, be good girls, won't you? And don't answer the door to anyone. I went out, along the balcony, creeping past old calves and down the stairs. I wondered if Baxter might simply be hiding there on the stairwell, but there was no sign of him. I sighed and trudged across the yard towards the playground. The rain pelted down. In a few seconds, Mum's headscarf was flattened against my head and my coat was drenched. You idiot, Baxter, I muttered, squinting through the solid sheet of rain. I went stomping and sploshing to the slide and hauled myself up the steps. Baxter, for goodness sake, I said. I expected him to leap out at me, but nothing happened. I got to the den at the top and scrambled inside. I peered around in the dark. I even felt the sodden logs. Baxter wasn't there. I stood up in a panic, banging my head. Baxter! I poked my head out again and looked all around the playground. There were the swings, swaying slightly as the rain beat down on them. There was so the muddy little roundabout. There was the pole with the rubber tyre dangling. No Baxter. No Baxter anywhere. I'd been so certain he'd come here. So where had he gone? Surely he hadn't really tried to go to the park all by himself. I didn't want to do... I didn't know what to do. My chest was so tight I couldn't breathe properly. How was I ever going to find him? I thought of that vast park stretching for miles, and now it would be a sea of mud. I pictured Baxter up to his knees, struggling, screaming for me. I'm coming, Baxter, I said, and I started running through the estate. I tried desperately hard to remember which way to go, and if I couldn't remember, how could Baxter? And what was I doing? What was I going to do about Bliss and Pixie? I couldn't leave them for hours while I trailed around the whole park. Bliss would get in a panic, convincing herself I wasn't coming back. I stood still, divering, sucking my lips into my face to stop myself crying. A woman from another block trudged past, shopping bags dangling from her arms as she struggled to keep her umbrella over her head. Nice weather for ducks, eh? she said. Well, don't just stand there. You're getting soaked. Go and take shelter. I suddenly wondered, where could you keep dry on the estate? On the balconies, the stairs, down in the rubbish shed? I nodded at the woman and ran back to our block of flats right round the corner. I pushed open the wooden door to the bin area and there was Baxter, sitting on the filthy floor amid a load of rubbish, flipping through the grubby pages of someone's girly magazine. Baxter! He jumped when I yelled at him and then grinned. Hey, come and look at this funny magazine. It shows all their rude bits. Put it down. Come here, you bad, bad boy. Don't you dare go off like that again. You told me to go. You said you didn't care, said Baxter. Well, I was bad too. Of course I care. Oh, Baxter, I was so worried about you. I grabbed him and hugged his bony little body hard. For just a second he hugged me back, but when I tried to rub my cheek against his bristly head, he wriggled and squirmed. You don't kiss me. I'm not kissing you. No fear. Come on, let's go home. Bliss will be worrying so. Bliss always worries, says ba said Baxter, especially about me. Yes, so you should be kinder to your sister. All your sisters, I said. We walked back towards the stairs. You don't have looked funny with that headscarf on, said Baxter. Thanks a bunch, I said, whipping it off and stuffing it in my pocket. And what have you got your coat on for? It's summer. I'm trying to keep dry because my mad brother went out in the pouring rain. I had to go looking for him, I said, giving him a shove. He shoved me back, but he was grinning. We ran up the stairs and knocked at the door. We waited. Nothing happened. Come on, Bliss, I muttered and knocked again. The door stayed shut. I opened the letterbox and peered in. I couldn't see anyone. The flat was silent. Maybe... They went out looking for me too, said Baxter. Bliss wouldn't do that, I said, but my chest was tight again. What if she'd got so worried 
She'd taken Pixie and they'd run out, out after me. Where were they now? And how were any of us going to get back safe indoors without a front door key? Bliss, I yelled through the letterbox. No one came, but I thought I heard whispers. Bliss, are you in there? Come and open the door. I listened, more whispering out of sight. And then I heard Pixie squealing. Pixie, Pixie, you come and answer the door. Pixie came running into view, bobbing along the hall. Bliss came rushing after her, trying to pull her back. For heaven's sake, will one of you silly girls answer the door? We're soaked to the skin, I said. Bliss crept fearfully along the hall towards me. That's it, come on, open it. Pixie jumped up before Bliss and managed to wriggle the latch all by herself. She got the door open and Baxter and I shot inside. Thank you, Bliss. What are you playing at? Bliss burst into tears. You told me not to answer the door. You did. You did when you went out. And then you were gone so long and I didn't know what to do. And then you came back and knocked and I was scared because I thought you might be a robber or someone bad. So I told Pixie we mustn't, mustn't, mustn't open it. But I called out to you. Yes, and it sounded like you, but it could have been a robber pretending to be you, speaking in a girl voice. Bliss sobbed. Bliss is being silly, isn't she, said Pixie. Bliss is always silly, said Baxter. Oh, Baxter, I thought you'd run away to the park without me, said Bliss. I'm not daft, it's too wet, said Baxter. Exactly, I said. Come here, let's get a towel to dry you a bit. I rubbed at him fiercely while he wriggled. This towel smells, he said. He was right, all the towels were smelling a bit now. We badly needed clean ones even when mum was here. We were running out of clean t-shirts and pants and socks too. We had a washing machine, but it didn't work anymore. Mum had been meaning to go down the social and beg for a new one, but she hated going there, so she never got, quite got round to it. She went to the laundrette instead, pushing great bags of washing in Pixie's buggy. I could do that. I knew exactly how to do a wash and then a dry. I'd done it heaps of times with mum, but we didn't have any money. I know what we'll do this morning. We'll do all the washing at home, I said. I made them collect up all the piles of dirty clothes while I ran the hot tap into the kitchen sink and chucked in lots of washing powder. When the kids saw the bubbles, they wanted to do the washing with me, which slowed things down considerably. Pixie insisted on getting in the sink and jumped up and down on the clothes. I'm stamping the dirt out, she shouted. I don't know about the stamping. She was certainly splashing. The kitchen floor was getting a good wash as well as the clothes. They all lost interest when it came to rinsing and then wringing out the soaking clothes. Had to struggle on by myself, water running up my sleeves right to my armpits. I didn't know what to do with the clothes when I'd finished at last. I could hang the light things up on the line in the bathroom that mum used for her tights and undies, but the big drippy towels would break it. In the end, I switched on the electric fire, arranged the chairs around it and hung the towels from their backs. This is very, very, very dangerous, I said. You mustn't go anywhere near or you'll start a fire. I managed to impress this on Baxter and Pixie enough for them to play at the other end of the room. Poor Bliss hid in the bedroom, calling out to us to be careful every two minutes. I turned the towels round every now and then, baking them on each side, and in an hour they were bone dry. There, I said triumphantly, burying my face in the towels. They smell lovely now, all fresh and flowery. Let's play bullfighters with them, said Baxter, grabbing a towel and flapping it wildly. Come on, Bliss, you be the bull, and I'll shove all my sticks in you. Stop it. Not with the fire on, I said, switching it off quickly, and not with the fire off either. Stop jabbing at poor Bliss. She's not Bliss, she's the bull. Bellow a bit, Bliss, and put your hands up to look like horns, Baxter encouraged her. Maybe I should have left you out in the rain, Baxter, I said. I gave us lunch early, just for something to do. Fish fingers and oven chips. I'd hoped it might stop raining by the afternoon, but it poured even harder. We watched television. Well, Bliss, Pixie and I watched television. Baxter acted out everything on the screen, pretending to be an antique expert and a quiz show host and a comedian and Tracy Beaker, repeating everything they said until we were all driven demented. It actually stopped raining about five o'clock and all three kids clamoured to go out. I was desperate to go too, but I couldn't help wondering if mum just might phone again. It would be terrible to miss her twice and maybe she'd worry if we weren't around for a second time. So I said we wouldn't go out and Baxter yelled at me and Pixie threw herself on the ground and kicked. Even Bliss pouted and acted fed up with me. Mum didn't call, though I sat hunched up beside the phone willing it to ring. I went from longing to hit longing to hear from her to hating her for not even bothering to try to talk to us again. I hated Baxter and Bliss and Pixie too, crying and moaning and complaining all the time. I barricaded myself in Mum's bedroom with my drawing book and invented a pure white, utterly soundproof bedroom for myself. It had white walls and white carpet, so soft it was like fur. I had white satin sheets and a white silk nightie with white lace. 
I sat on a white velvet stool in front of the glittering Venetian glass mirror of my dressing table and brushed my hair with an ivory-backed brush, and then I lay down in my soft bed in utter silence. I lived all alone. I had no mother, no brother, no sisters. I muttered to myself as I drew, even though I could hear Baxter bashing and Bliss begging and Pixie yelling her head off. But then Bliss started crying too, high-pitched and panicking, and I couldn't blot them out any more. "'What is it?' I said, stamping to the door and flinging it open. Bliss covered her face and made frantic gulping sounds, trying to stop crying. I looked at Baxter, who was red in the face. "'What have you done to her?' I demanded. "'I haven't done anything.' "'Yes, you jolly well have.' "'I haven't even touched her,' said Baxter, widening his eyes and jutting his chin, acting innocent. "'Bliss, what did he say?' I asked. Bliss shook her head. She'd never ever tell tales on Baxter, no matter what he did. Luckily, Pixie blabbed like anything. She stopped her own howling to gasp. He said you'd run away, and then carried on yelling. Stop that silly noise. You're giving us all a headache. What's this rubbish about, Baxter? Of course I haven't run away, silly. It was you who did that, not me. Yeah, but I said you could run away and not come back like mum. I said you were maybe running away right that minute because we couldn't get in the bedroom door and you were ever so quiet and wouldn't answer us. I said you might have done a runner out the window. Baxter, we're on the first floor. If I jumped out the window, I'd fall to my death. I know that, but I can't help it if Bliss is silly enough to believe it, said Baxter. Oh, you're so horrible to poor Bliss. Come here, darling. I cradled Bliss in my arms. Her eyes were screwed shut, but tears still seeped down her cheeks and her nose was running too. Look at the state of you. Baxter, don't you feel sorry? No, she's silly, said Baxter. I'm not silly, said Pixie, bouncing up, suddenly bored with crying. They chased each other all around the flat, squealing, while I sat Bliss on the edge of Mum's bed and rocked her in my arms until she stopped gasping and heaving. There now, better? Bliss sniffed and nodded, nuzzling against my chest. You mustn't let Baxter tease you so. He walks all over you, I said gently. He didn't walk on me, Bliss mumbled, taking me literally. I know, but he just wants to wind you up. You mustn't take him seriously. You know I wouldn't jump out the window. Yes, but you could maybe creep out the door, Bliss whispered. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay with you and Baxter and Pixie forever. Well, if I do have to nip out for anything, I promise I'll always, always come back. We sat there, hugging hard, thinking about mum. And that is where we will leave part three of Lily Alone by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon on my channel. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.